trust the Lord in it this morning. You can start us with prayer. this morning let me explain something to you Stephanie's not sick they don't have nothing going on with them Stephanie and Chris and Gracie have gone to Statesboro Dawson is preaching at this morning at the church where he's a youth minister he's preaching today so they've gone up to surprise him and I would assume they'll be back in time for service tonight and so they're not sick everything's fine thank you all for being here love every one of you Amen. and we've come to worship God right Amen. doesn't matter what building we're in doesn't matter the music we're going to do or not do. Amen. Doesn't matter anything, we've come to worship God, right? Amen. That's a personal thing. So Amen. we need to make sure that we do it and have a good time with it. So let's all get ready. We're going to pray, and then we're going to ask God to come and bless us in a very special way today. Father, we love you. It is so, Father, we love you. It is so good to be in your house. I thank you for this privilege and this opportunity. And God, today I just ask that you receive what we give you from our hearts. And I pray, God, that our worship, whether it be in music, whether it be in prayer, or whether it just be a sweet whisper from our hearts, Amen. I pray that it will honor you in such a way that today it would touch you and you would rise from your rest and that you would be blessed because of our love towards you. We pray for everybody in here to be together in the unity of the Spirit and those who are watching, that God, your Spirit, be upon them. Now, we're here and we're thankful for it. And we're going to show you that. And then, God, we're going to wait for you to bless in such a powerful way. Thank you for all you've done, all you're going to do. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again. Uh, and, you know, as a child, one of the first verses I can remember is uh, the verse that says, I'm, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord, you know. And I am so glad to be in the house of the Lord. When you're away, I just miss y'all. I, 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 don't, I, I don't miss the Lord because I can worship him out on the dirt road or wherever, but, but it's good to be with fellow Christians, and it's good to encourage and be encouraged. And right now, let's lift up his name. We may be small in number, but we, let's exalt his name.
every one of us ought to be doing. And we are doing that, and we're thankful we can do it. But God also wants us to honor him in other ways. One of the ways that we do that is by honoring people that's among us, lifting them up and praising them, preferring your brother rather than yourself, encouraging. That's one of the things we do, and that's how we honor God when we show that kind of love. This morning, we're doing that in a very special way. Now, some of you are wearing hats today, and some of you look at it and you wonder, what's the hats all about? Well, today, some of our ladies got together, and they want to honor Miss Maria Clark. So, <clears throat> so this is a very special day in honor of Maria. Now, Cindy's going to come, and she's going to share something with you in just a minute. If y'all want to sit down for a second, you can. Cindy may get long-winded. She's not like me. <clears throat> Hey, let's, let's give her a mic. Uh, take a mic to her. <clears throat> I hope I can get through this. <laughs> the Lord laid on my heart to do something special for my friend. And I went to the preacher and asked, and I started telling people of the church. And they all was excited to do this and to participate so in honor of you coming to church through the good and the bad weather through all the sickness and everything we go through i found this and i want to read it to you and it says i could list countless faithful women who have had an impact on my life i realize each one has similar traits these characteristics are what compel me to do better to try harder, to love deeper, endure longer, reach higher, see clear, and above all, realize the power of God's grace and the hope of his promises. <laughs> there are women I have had the honor to know, to love, and share life with, and I reach my arms to you in a hug to thank you and tell you you're a living testimony to the goodness of people and the greatness of God. And I know this is from me and all the ladies and all the people here in the Kettle Creek Church. We love you. We want to give you something else. I want you to open this and make sure you understand what this is for. It's, it's a bracelet, and the bracelet is, this is the faith of the mustard seed. So... And then we have something else. <laughs> For your collection. And we can't wait to see you wear this. <laughs> we know you will. <laughs> oh, how sweet. We love you. You're welcome. You're welcome. We truly love you. <laughs> Today is the day. It is the day. Whatever we need, God has it for us today. Amen. I think myself personally, sometimes we don't understand what we need. We think we need a lot of stuff, and we think we need a lot of trappings that bring on worries and problems, and, but what we need is right up there. And he says, be still and know. Today is the day. Okay? So whatever you need, you just 
receive it from God, okay? We're ready, guys. be your welcome. You are welcome here, Lord. You are here before we were here. Uh, you welcome us. We welcome you. And let's show him with our praise.
Everything. You know why I'm standing here today? Grace of God. That's why you're standing here today. So think about think about what you're saying and singing.
job, baby. And Father, we do praise you this morning. As has already been said, God, we praise you for life. We praise you for dying on Calvary so that we could live, forgiving us of our sins, preparing us, and walking with us. For a good heart and a good mind to be in your house today. For the health to be here. And God, I pray today as we go into your word that you help us to understand and to receive the wisdom that you've prepared for each of our lives. God, we just say this morning, we sure do love you. Amen. We do. And we just ask you to heal those who are sick. Comfort, strengthen, whatever needs to be done. And God, I thank you for each person that's here. We tell you, we sure love you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to go ahead and be opening your Bible to the book of Acts, chapter 2. <clears throat> now, a couple things before <clears throat> I get into the message. I said that I'm glad to see each of you here today, <clears throat> and I certainly am. You're thrilling to my heart, and I sure love you. <clears throat> it's um, good to have Jimmy Johnson back in service Amen. with us. <clears throat> good to have Chris O'Berry back in service with us. <clears throat> and I surely miss somebody like this, but those that have been sick and been hurting, it's always good when you get back in God's house. Amen. Our body is incomplete when even one person is missing. And God is good to us. And I do thank you for being here today and for all that God wants to do for us and to us and through us. <clears throat> I want to thank our IT department for getting us back online. They got everything fixed up, and we're back today live, and um, just pray that uh, we'll continue to stay that way. Now, let me give you an update on the church as far as what we know. The, basically, the church is finished with the carpentry. There's a little, little bit of stuff, but basically it's finished. We're waiting now on the carpet and the pews. Um, if everything goes well, the carpet will be in the first of next week. <clears throat> and then as soon as it gets here, I think they're going to put it in for us. After that will be the pews, and the pews wait on the carpet. So there's where we are with the church. The, fellas, the um, kitchen area has all been uh, finished, uh, looking great. Um, you're going to love it when we get back down there. That's all I can tell you. But we're close. We, you know, we're very close, and we're going to see what's going to happen. But maybe the carpet first of next week and get it in here, and then we'll see what we're going to do after that, okay? But basically, that's where we are. Everything's looking good, so bear with us. doesn't matter where we worship. Just bear with us. I know it's going to be good to get back up there. I know that I can't wait either. But until then, we're going to do what God wants us to do right here. All right, now, <clears throat> this coming Wednesday night, I'm going to start the series. I want to teach on this book. I said that God told me that I wrote it ahead of time, which, which is what he wanted, you know, to get us ready. But he said, now's the time for this book to be brought forth. So I'm going to teach it this coming Wednesday. And then we, right now, I'm just planning on teaching it on Wednesday nights. There are 20 chapters in here. We'll see what we're going to do. I encourage you, if you do not have a book, we've got plenty of them up here. Get you one after the service today. <clears throat> if you want to take one and give it to somebody. I've got plenty of books. I'll give them to you. Take them and give them to somebody. But you get it. Read it. Read the first and second chapter or whatever. And let's get ready. And we're going to try to teach this Wednesday and let God 
share with you what he shared with me for the purpose of writing this, okay? So get your books afterwards. They're up here, and you're certainly welcome to them. Now, Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> we're going to look at something this morning. <clears throat> we're going to begin with verse 42. And I want to read a few verses and, and just set this up the way God said. What we have here is this is after the day of Pentecost. This is after the disciples are, and God's people, there were basically 120 people, went to the upper room as God told them to. And they waited for the Lord to do something. While they were there, the Holy Spirit descended upon that building. And there was at least 120 people inside that building. When the Spirit of God fell upon them, I said it was like cloven tongues. Something just come out of the sky and lit on. They all began to worship God and praise God. They didn't care where they were. They didn't care what they were doing. They, don't, they didn't care who saw them or who heard them. They began speaking in tongues. They began glorifying God. Outside that building was a festival going on. And there were multitudes of people there that day for the festival. When they heard the excitement going on in this room, they began to stop and listen. And they were amazed because the, there were different nationalities, different nations there. And they were amazed because they said, my goodness, they're speaking in my language. I can understand them. So what God was giving them was a heavenly language that many people there in their own different tongues understood. And then you always had those naysayers. They said, no, nah, this ain't of God. They're drunk. They just drunk. Well, when they came out of that building, Peter went out to the people and he began to preach. This is the same Peter that prior to this had denied even knowing God and ran in fear for his life. But when the Holy Spirit came on him that day in that upper room, it changed his life forever. He walked out of that building and he began to preach. And the Bible said he told them, you were the ones that killed this Christ. He came for us to deliver us, to set us free, and you are the ones who killed him. And he began to be bold with what he said. He began to make all these accusations, and the power of God is all over him, speaking through him. And when he got through, it says that 3,000 people were saved that one day with that one sermon. Amen. Now, God can do what he wants to. So now we have all of a sudden not just a bunch of followers of Christ, we have, we have Christians besides the disciples, besides that 120, we have at least 3,000 more that have come to know Christ, and they were called as a body, the church, not a building, the church, the people. For the first time, there's a church, and now they don't know what to do. So this group of people, the Bible says later on, God says, I have called you out. I have anointed you. I have chosen you to be a special people. So his church, his people are a special people, and we're different from the rest of the world. Not that we are better. We're better through Christ. It has nothing to do with us, but we're a separate people. We have to live in the world, but we don't have to live like the world. Amen. So we're different. And they, they didn't know what to do. And it says they came together somewhere. They came together. Now, all of a sudden, we have Paul, or Peter, trying to know, understand from God, what do I do with these group of people? You know, we've been blessed. We've been anointed. What do we do with it? And God began to, his spirit began to fall again on Peter, but his spirit also fell on these 3,000 or more people that are there. And now we get these scriptures describing what's going on. And it says, and they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Fear came upon all these people. Not a fear like we're afraid of the virus or we're afraid of dying or we're afraid of... No, it was a respect and an awe from God. They realized all of a sudden they had something special. They didn't know what it was. But they knew they had something special, and they began to act in a certain way that they had not acted ever before in their life. And fear came upon them. And all that believed were together, and they had all things in common. So all that believed, these over these 3,000 people plus the 120, all these people there believed they were together, and they had all things in common. They realized, I'm not better than Tommy Smith. 
Tom Humphreys is not better than me. Jimmy, Jimmy Brandt is not a better Christian than I am. They realize we have all things in common. And the root of that was Jesus Christ. Everything was centered around Christ. When we understand we all are serving the same God, then we all have everything in common. We are all equal, not because of what we have here, but because of what we believe in and who he is, because he owns all things. Amen. Wow, what a thought that is. And they sold their possessions and their goods, and they parted them to all men and to any man that had any kind of need. So this spirit came upon them of unity and togetherness in Christ and realizing we have all things, we're all family, they just began to sell what they had, put it in a pot, and everybody could have what they needed, not what they wanted, what they needed, and understand the power of God was upon them. So you didn't have these running and grabbing a bunch because they wanted a bunch. It just the Spirit of God led them. If they needed something, they got it. If they didn't, they didn't because they were being directed by the Spirit of God, not the Spirit of man. So they took everything, shared everything, and they became one. And they continued daily with one another in accord in the temple. So now we see them moving to the temple. They've got to figure out. They, they don't know what to do. They're just a group of people that something's happened to that they know is mighty. So they move to the temple now, and they begin to worship in there. And they were breaking the bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So they went to the temple, and they worshiped there, and then they went to people's houses. They just began to go, y'all come over to my house, and, and let's eat, and let's talk about the Lord. They became one. Everything they did, it was a body of believers all of a sudden that had all things in common and just couldn't get enough of God. They would go and do what they should in the temple, like Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday, we come here and worship. They would come and be a part of that. But other than that, they would go out and, and share and say, come to my house. I want to feed you. Come to my house. Let's do this. And they began to share all, everything. And they had gladness and singleness of heart. One desire to serve God. Singleness of heart. One God. One desire. God. And they were praising God and having favor with all the people. Think about that. You can't please everybody. Well, this sort of contradicts that, doesn't it? Praising God and having favor with all people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So daily they were adding to the church. But why? And how? God, help us to understand. Help us to understand. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to move upon our people. You did it in the upper room. Why not this room? In that upper room that day, they were gathered together because they wanted to be there. 500 heard you say, now go back to the upper room and wait and tarry until I come. 500 heard it, but only 120 obeyed your voice. God, this house should be filled this morning, but it's not. But the thing is, you will anoint those that are here. Amen. Because when the people show up where you tell them to, divine things happen. And that 120 receives something that the 500 didn't. And then the 120 goes out. And the new church is born. Show us how to create a new church at Kettle Creek. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, what would it take for us to emulate that church and let God do what he wants to do? Wouldn't it have been great to have been there that day? Wow, what a thought. 500 people heard it, only a fourth of them obeyed it. Does that look like the world today? Yeah, except the numbers are a lot less today. There's so much deception in our world that we just don't know what to do. And I've heard it said, I've thought it, God, if I could just, if I could just do more, if I could just feel, if I could just understand, 
Well, God's trying to tell us today that we can. There is a formula to what happened with this church. First of all, they were in church. First thing, they go. he said, go to the upper room and stay there until I show up. And we don't have the patience to do that today. They were not there just a few minutes. They were there days. But when they waited with hungry hearts, God fulfilled it. And I would say to you today, how hungry are you for God? What are you willing to give up for God? There have been, there have been more prayers go out to God since this virus came than, than have been in a long time. Because so many people cry out to God only when they get in a situation where they can't handle it. Then we call on God. And some can say, better to call on God that way than not call on Him at all. Yeah, okay, I understand that, but we don't know that your prayers are serious when you do that. Because if you're serving God like you should have, you'd been calling on Him way before it happened, trusting Him while it happened, and believing everything's going to work while it's going on. But we don't. We just panic at the end, then we call on God. Well, God, look at this church. They went there not knowing what they were going there for, not knowing what the Holy Spirit is, though they didn't even know what it was. But as Jesus went up, he said, now go. And the one I'm on, I got to go, but I'm going to leave one behind, and he will be your comforter. And everything we're going to face, we need a comforter. Everything we go through in life, we need a comforter. And he said, it's here. So he blessed them. They go out, they preach, and now the first church is born. And I want you to look at the very first verse. As that church is born, it says, And they, the church, these that have been saved, the church, steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. There are the four keys to a successful Christian life and a successful church. Now, I want you to understand something. We're not the biggest church in Waycross, Georgia. Neither are we the smallest. We're not the biggest church in the country. Neither are we the smallest. The size of the church has nothing to do with the power of God. Amen. I want us to understand that. I wish that our church was slap full. I wish that we would have to go up to that property that God gave us and build another church. I wish that church could seat thousands of people. I do. I wish it all would happen. But I desire God wherever we are. Amen. I don't care if we built the, uh, uh, the biggest building, the monastery, whatever you want to. It doesn't matter. We can fill it full of people. But if God is not in it, if it's gimmicks that get you there, if it's that you like the preacher that it gets you there, if you like the song service and, and the way that we do this, if that's what gets you there, then we might as well just shut the church down. Amen. If God is not in it, it is nothing but a man-made monastery, and there is no power in that kind of thing. Amen. I love God. I, I love God, and I sure wish I had a huge church that believed in God. I do. I'm like any other person. But I'll tell you this, I'm separated from other people by one thought. I look for one of you that are hunting, hungry for Jesus Christ, and I preach my heart out to you. I look for one of you that want Jesus Christ, and I pour my love out to you. Because it's not the masses, it's one at a time. This world will be changed one person at a time. The church will be changed one person at a time. We'll all go to heaven one person at a time, and I look for that one person. Now, there was a group of people here, and they didn't know what to do with them. I've been given a group of people. It doesn't matter that we've got empty seats. I wish we did, but that's between God and that person or those people that aren't here. That's between them, whatever it is. They're going to face God one day because of that. But the thing is, we've got to focus on what we got. How can we make this work? What does God want us to do? And he gives us a perfect example, four things here that the church must do to survive. If this church will do what God says, this church will be full. Amen. See, we, we don't all get a hold of that because we don't believe it. But I promise you, if we do what God said, this church would be full. Amen. It would. We just got to want it. So it says, it says they, they first they began by listening to the apostles' teachings. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. 
they began to live what the, what the prophets, apostles, Peter was preaching. They began to live it, and they lived steadfast in their teaching. We've got to learn. I'm no different than any one of you. Ricky Clark can get up here under the anointing of God and preach just like I do. There's no difference. I, I'm just a human being that God has chosen to do his work. It's only if I yield to him that God can use me the way he wants to. I want to preach the gospel to you. I've tried to preach the gospel from the front to the back ever since I've been here, not leaving one thing out because I believe everything in the Bible. I believe everything in the Bible. They spoke in tongues. I believe in it. I speak in tongues because I want God to work through me. If you don't, that's okay. I'm just telling you, I believe everything there front to back. I believe in divine healing, that God can reach out and touch any person because I saw him bring Brenda back from the dead. I know God can do anything. There is nothing impossible to God. I believe in divine healing. I believe in the works of God. I believe that God can use anybody that he wants to. He can touch any person. He can change their lives, and they can take what God does to them and give it to somebody else, and the whole thing become a boomer and this whole church be changed. I believe in it. Front to back, I believe God's word. And I want to preach God's word. And I've tried to preach it. But you have to be able to accept me as your pastor, not just a man, but a man of God. And the words I speak are God speaking through me to you. Amen. That's See, they believe in the apostles' doctrine, not the apostles. The apostles' doctrine. What was their doctrine? The word of God. See, they believe it. You've got to accept it. You can't come in here because it's Sunday, and I'm not sure about that. I, you know, it was a good sermon, but I can't do that. You know, no, you've got to believe it. If they said it's the apostles, whatever they preached, they believed it. See, they had all things in common. They were united. They were a family. And all of a sudden, everything that was said was for everybody. I'm a black sheep, and nobody, you know, well, I, I just can't understand. No, they had all things in common. God is able to make every person in this building understand, every person, no matter what their age, no matter, it doesn't make any difference. God has the ability if you're willing to listen. So they listened to the apostles' doctrine, and they accepted it, and they began to live what the apostles were preaching because it was the word of God. Second, it said, and they had fellowship. So they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They had fellowship. Think about it. They had friendship. They participated. They shared. They were a community. They understood there was something different about this group of people. They weren't better than anybody else, but there was something different because it was the anointing of the Holy Spirit that was saying to them, I've called you out, I've separated you, I've anointed you. There's something special here. So they began to have fellowship. Now, once God calls you out, you've got a world of friends. Think about it. When you were sinners, where did you go? What kind of things did you do? What kind of friends did you have? Pretty rough. And we talked about them old holy rollers. Yeah? Then all of a sudden you get saved. Now all of a sudden something's different. This ain't right. <laughs> Something's wrong here. And the fellowship then began to be with other believers. God created a new group of friends for you to fellowship with. See, he didn't say you hate them other people. The places you used to go, you realize I can't go there anymore. The things you used to do, I can't do that anymore. God, what am I going to do? He said, no problem. I got new places for you to go. It's called the house of God. I got new friends for you. They're called Christians. I've got people that you can, deal, that you can deal with and you can fellowship with and you can have friendship with and you can become a community of believers that have all things in common. All things because they believe the word of God. All things are in common. And nothing matters except the word of God. The community, we've got to have fellowship in the church. I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you something in just a minute, but he said, they said they had fellowship in the church. So he said they continued steadfast in the doctor, the apostles' doctrine. They had fellowship in the church and the breaking of bread. It is important for God's people to eat. Skylar, come on, amen. Amen. Thank you, Skylar. <laughs> it's important for us to eat. Some of us eat like hogs. Some of us eat like sparrows. But it's important for us to eat. So he says that. So they were believing the word. They were fellowshipping. 
and they were also eating because they had relaxing times of eating, laughing, and caring. Now, the greatest thing that we've always done in this church is had church. Fellowship with God, worship, praise, honor, and glory. But some of the next best things we had were the parties we had, were the fellowship that we had, the gathering together. I, I went through some photos the other day that I had. I don't know where I got them from, but um, they were of us in here in a big supper. And you can just look at all those pictures, table after table, of people laughing and sharing and cutting a fool, and you just think of those good old times. You see, fellowship is what the church has to have. So we've been called out from all that stuff we used to do, and now we have to replace it with something else. And God says, you listen to the word, and you fellowship here, and then you eat together. It's a time of relaxing, of resting, a time of, of fellowship where we just, we just, we just, it's easy. You know, people will prepare it. And as they prepare it, it's a wonderful thing. I, I don't know how much of you, I, I, I could tell you, but I don't know how many of you are involved when we cook. But, you know, cooking is a hard thing. You have to come days, sometimes early, and you a lot of hard work. But it's fun preparing for somebody else. The fellowship we have back there. I got pictures of us cooking back there and, and people just all over the place in that room and taking snaps of them and they're laughing and they're cutting the food and they're bumping each other and they're shoving here and shoving there. It's just fellowship. It's just, just something different about it, you know? I watch this when we feed the tur when we do the turkeys. We cooked 17 turkeys a uh, year before last, 17 turkeys. We had five guys out there working hard, dipping and, 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 and making sure the timer right and pulling the turkeys out. And they'd get them out and they'd put them on the table. And then we'd get over our gloves and we'd start cutting them and butt our, burn ourselves, you know. Then we'd reach over and grab a bite to eat. And you just, it's, it's just, there's just something different about it. We have to have that. We got to get back to it. We got to. And once we get back up there, we're going to do it down here. We're going we're gonna to do it. And if you don't want to come because you're afraid of it, then stay home. But, you know, we've got to do it. You have to have fellowship, and you have to have times of working together. And it says, that, and it says, and they then, they listened steadfast to the apostles' doctrine, and they had fellowship, and they had breaking of bread, and they continued in prayer. Amen. Prayer. Talking and listening to God. Because that is the source of our strength. Amen. It's the source of it. It is the source of our strength. The source of our strength. We don't pray enough, myself included. We don't pray enough to God. But he said they continued listening, fellowship, eating, and praying. They prayed. We have to pray individually because we can't always be together. But they had times of coming together and praying. And we're going to begin Saturday night prayer again this coming Saturday night. We, we had to put it off. We've put it off. Now we're starting again. So I'm telling all of you, those of you on TV watching, we're starting again Saturday night prayer. I encourage every one of you to be here. I can't encourage it enough. You want God to bless this church in this coming year. You want God to bless you. You want to thank God for bringing you out of this virus when you had it and you didn't die. You want to thank God. For, then let's gather in prayer. And spend a few minutes. We don't stay here long. Let's just spend a few minutes together as a body praying and thanking God. Well, I don't know what to do. Well, come and just sit here. Amen. Just be in God's presence. It's not magical words. It's not great words. It's not enough to just say, God, I thank you. And by showing up, you're showing God that. He's given you everything you have. Give him some of your time. We've got to come together in prayer. Amen. We've got to. As we come together in prayer, we're praying for one another. We're praying for our country. We're praying for this church. But we've got to come together in prayer. It was one of the four things that made that church thrive. They listened to the doctrine. They had fellowship. They ate together. And they prayed together. They did all these things together. It is a unity. It is a corporate body. And we've got to do it. And I encourage you. I encourage you to bring kids with you. Now, I do. There's no better place in the world they can be than God's house. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when they get older, they're going to remember it. But you stay at home. You stay away from the church. You let somebody else do all the praying for you, and your children are going to watch it, and they're going to remember I don't have to. 
It wasn't my mom and daddy. They didn't care. They didn't do it, so I don't have to either. And then you wonder when they get out there in the world, you wonder when things stop happening to them, you wonder when they get the virus, you wonder why, you know. And God will tell you, because you left out one important thing, the gathering together of the saints. I'm encouraging all of you, give time to God in this coming year. Start next week. Come together and pray. We won't stay here long. It's not that. It's we've got to do what God said. Hear the word, fellowship, eat, and pray. That was the four things they did to get everything going. Now, look at this today in the society that we live in. The devil wants to do away with all these four things. He knows that it's what made the church work. Listen, it says, and they all that believed were together and they had all things in common. They were together, had all these four things in common. They did them all. All of us did them. There were 12 disciples. They all walked with Jesus Christ daily. They saw what he did. They listened to what he did. They were God's men. But there was one. There was one. He decided he didn't have to do it God's way. He walked with Jesus, which meant he came to church. He walked with God. He heard him. He did all those things. But one of them didn't believe. One of them was a rotten apple. And in the end, that one betrayed God. In the end, that one died. In the end, that one winds up in hell. In the church today, we're a body. We're one. God wants us to be in unity. All of us doing the same thing. Some of us are going to have to break our habits to come on Saturday night. We've got to break our habits. But you've got to make some stands this year. What am I going to do? What, what does God want? What am I going to do? I vow before God I'm going to be in every service that the church has. You make that to God. I'm going to do it. Now, surely there will be things happen. I understand that. But you've got to make a commitment somewhere. You've got to make that commitment. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So I'm going to be in church. I'm going to hear God's word. I'm going to not be disturbed. If you're being disturbed by other people where you're sitting, move. For heaven's sake, don't sit there and use that as an excuse. Move. Move up to the front. Get away from those things that's disturbing. You've got to hear God's word. I'm going to focus in this year. This is going to be my year. I'm going to hear the word. I'm going to follow the word. I'm going to obey the word. I'm going to change some of my habits. I'm going to fellowship with some of the people. I'm going to eat. I'm going to do everything God wants me to do. This is my year. I'm going to give my tithes. I haven't been given like I should have. I'm going to give my tithes. We missed two services. Have you caught up yet? Yep. God expects you to. He says, do it. I'm going to make myself do it. See, we've got to commit ourselves. So I am going to be one of those people this year. I'm going to pray. I'm going to join that group. I'm going to expect great things to happen. Now, in saying that, the devil then knows that there are four keys to the church of God becoming great. So what does the devil do? He starts tearing those four things up. He doesn't want you to do them. So you have a fight. Obey God or obey the devil. No, no in between. What are you going to do? It says they chose to be one body, fellowshipping together, hearing the word, serving God, going to the temple, going to people's houses. They, they chose to do all that. So they defeated Satan. But what about me and you? What are we going to do? What's going to be your commitment this coming year? We know that the devil is going to try to stop you. He's going to try to tear this up. It says, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple and the breaking of bread and so on and so on. Uh, they did all those things. And then it says, and they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily. So how is this church going to grow? It's not about the numbers. It's about, do you care about other people filling these seats hearing the word of God? So they can be saved and go to heaven. Do you care about it? Yeah. I'm here, that's enough. No, it's not. You got an empty seat in this church, we haven't done our job. So what are we going to do? The devil says, okay, I'm going to stop you. So he's either going to do one of four things, or two of four things, or three or four things, or four or four things in your life. If we're supposed to listen to the word, he's going to let you be distracted. Not listen to the word. If you can't listen to the word where you are, move. It's never going to be an excuse when you get to heaven. Well, that, those people are cutting up all around me. I just, I just get so sick and tired of it. God, I tried. God's going to say, you could have moved. You have legs. Amen. Pick your chair up and put it right up here beside me. Hear the word. It says they fellowship. 
Well, I don't like some of them. Well, you're not a Christian. Oops. Get saved. You'll like everybody. I'm, I'm not kidding you. It is true. You leave them like the sinners. You don't like what they're doing, but you're going to learn to love them. Fellowship. The devil's going to stop you. The eating. Somebody has to prepare it. Be one that's willing to prepare as well as eat. And then pray. So the devil's either going to stop you from hearing the word, stop you from having fellowship, stop you from being part of the eating process where we come together, or stop you from praying. Because he knows if he can stop you from any one of the four things, he's got a foothold in your life. Amen. What are you going to surrender to God this year? I'm going to do all four, God. But the devil's going to come against you. How does he do that? What's happening in the world today? What's happening in the world? The direction of the world today is for us to be in quarantine and disengage from one another. Quarantine and disengage. Now, they tell me that after you have the virus, that you're immune for three months. So everybody's had the virus. Why aren't they in church? They're immune for three months. But see, the devil has convinced us, no, I don't need to go back. I got to wait for this thing to get over. When's it going to get over? Two years, three years down the road? Okay, we got shots coming out. What's the shot supposed to do? Supposed to make you immune, right? So that means you can go right back to church immediately. You're immune. But they won't do it. Because they have believed a lie. And they love themselves more. I better be careful. Better be careful. Because you'll learn to love yourself more than you love God. Amen. We have to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Amen. Not the ways of the world. God separated those people. He made a community of believers out of them. If you're a Christian today, God has separated you. He's made a community out of you. What is your commitment to God? The devil says, I'm going to take you away from fellowship quarantine, disengagement. Now listen, I understand. If you got the virus, you need to be in quarantine. Okay, I, I don't have a problem with that. But I do have a problem about this after effect thing. I do have a problem with people that don't have it but want to be quarantined. I do have a problem with us thinking things that's given to us by the devil and not God. Amen. I do have a problem with us fearing things and not fearing God. I do have a problem with that. Because I'm your pastor, and it's my job to tell you the truth. Amen. The devil is a liar. Amen. And too many of God's people today are listening to the lies of the Amen. devil and Amen. believing them rather than believing God. We've got to learn to be different. i got to hurry through this. Let me give you this very quickly. In the book of 2 Timothy, he said, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days, and people will be lovers of themselves, ungrateful, and unholy. In Romans, he says, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Take the lead in honoring one another. Take the lead in honoring. Well, they haven't done anything for me. Well, what have you done for them? Well, they didn't speak to me. Did you speak to them? Amen. Take the lead, he says here, in loving one another. Go to that person back there that doesn't want a fellowship and go fellowship with them. You greet Fist pump them, shake their hand, whatever it is, but let them know you're glad to see them. We're all brothers and sisters, and let's come together and let's act like it. The second thing is we have to understand that the, that the church protects us from outside threats. Amen. The devil's trying to tear, tear the he's trying to tear the church apart. That's the first part. Red Rover, Red Rover. <laughs> yeah, where did we go? The weakest strength. wink, wink. The weakest link. We ran to it and tried to break through it. Red Rover, Red Rover. Who's the weakest link in this church? I guarantee you the devil's coming against you because he sees you as weak. Show him you're strong. There is unity in the body of Christ. 
There is strength in the body of Christ, and we have to live it. He says that the church, we protect one another from outside threats. In 1 Peter, stay alert for the devil like a roaring lion goes about seeking whom he may devour. Amen. It's a community. We've got to protect one another, and there is protection in the body of Christ. We've got to stay that way. And he says the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose, says God, is to give life and in it all fullness. Amen. The unity. We've got to be unified. I want to tell you something very quickly. I told Jack about this last night. I got to go hunting the other day. I'm sitting there hunting deer. I look up, and all of a sudden, turkeys start coming out. <laughs> and all of a sudden, 17 turkeys came out in front of me. They ate all the way down the field, turned around and walked, and came back, ate again. I thought they was fixing to go in the woods. Four of them went in the woods. Thirteen of them stayed out. And they're there eating. And I just happened to look over like that, and I saw a bobcat sneaking under woods, right beside the woods. He's fixing to get a free meal. And I thought, wow. So I saw something I've never seen in my life. Seventeen, uh, Thirteen turkeys all of a sudden stopped eating, raised their heads up, and turned towards the bobcat. That's all they were doing, just a standoff, just looking at him. And then 13 turkeys walked towards the bobcat. I could not believe this. The bobcat turned and went in the woods. The 13 turkeys came and stood where he went in the woods and stood there just looking. Not eating, just looking. That's all they did, just look. They stayed there 10 minutes at least looking where that wild bobcat went. After a while, 11 of them went back out to the middle of the field and started eating, and two stayed just looking at the same spot. That's all they were doing, looking. A few minutes later, one of the two left, went out to the middle. One stayed just looking. Finally, he goes back. Never seen anything in my life like it. But God told me this. You see, that those turkeys all of a sudden decided, we're a group, we're a church. Here's the enemy coming after us. We can run and hide or we can go in force. And they scared the bobcat. You see, up here, I'm all by myself. You can take a, somebody can come in and take a crack shot at me if you want to. But what happens when I get out here? Now I'm a member of the body. I'm protected. I got brothers and sisters going to rise up in my case, and they're going to come against the enemy to help me fight. We, we have fellowship together. I, I love you guys. Hey, Danny Callahan, I'm good to see. What's oh, yeah. your name? Tommy Smith, I remember you. <laughs> see, we make new friends. All of a sudden, he's got my back. Yes. When, when the enemy comes, I'm not up there fighting him alone. I've got, I've got 13 other turkeys helping me fight this battle. <laughs> and do you know those four turkeys that had gone in and came out, and they joined the group again? Now there were 17 of them watching the enemy. But they, they scared the enemy. Resist. Rebuke. What the Bible says. Yes. But we have to do it as a body. Yes. The only way you can do that is love everybody in here. Amen. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to pray with you. I'm, I'm going to do this. We're going to fellowship. We're going to, you, as a body of believers, and thank God that I have people protecting me as long as I'm in the body. Amen. But you let me come. So what does the devil want to do? All he wants to do is separate us. You don't have to come and pray. You don't have to come to church. All Just separate you. Just do something different. Get out there alone. And guess what? Bobcats are brave when there's one-on-one. -on -one, and he will eat your lunch. The devil, like a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may. And he may only on those who are weak and outside the body of fellowship of Christ. Don't get caught out there, church. Don't be a dead turkey. Not this coming year. And then he says the church is a source of encouragement, support, and accountability. As a body of believers, you pick me up when I'm weak. It's a source of encouragement, support, and accountability. Do you think it's okay if I don't go to church tomorrow? I mean, what do you think, Billy? Billy's going to look me in the face and say, no, you need to be in church. Accountability. I didn't see you at church, so now where were you? Accountability. See, strength, the sport, 
I'm there to pick you up when you fall down, not to step on you, not to laugh at you, not to make about fun of you, not to talk about you. I'm here to pick you up, support, accountability. We need one another, and we have that once we're inside the body of Christ. But the devil would have you get outside of that. I can do it. Who are you to tell me anything, Billy? You see, no, I need accountability. I need people to say, Danny, I don't think you should do this. Or I think you need to go here. I think we need to do this. Accountability. We've got to be accountable here because we are accountable to God. So we've got to do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many times do you have somebody say, I just don't think I can do it? Accountability. You can do it because the Bible says you can do all things through Christ. Amen. Accountability. We need to be together in the Word. See, we have to hear the Word, live the Word, so when the time comes, we can give the Word to one another. If you believe you can do all things through Christ, then when someone says they can't, you can say, wait a minute now. You know what Philippians 4.13 says? You can encouragement, support. That's why we need the church. And the last way, we need the church in order to have the gifts that God has for us in order for us to be able to survive. All of us have gifts. God takes Jimmy's gift that he's given him, a boldness. He takes that gift and he mixes it in. So we have a bold and one who's not so bold, and the bold teaches the one that is not so bold. We have Rebecca up here who's such a loving and caring and wonderful person, such a sweet attitude. And then we have old Sour over there. And Sour, when they come in, they mix with sweet. And through the fellowship, they learn to be sweet together. Or we have gifted people like Nona that have the gift of God. And we have somebody over here that can't even put two candlesticks together, can't even light a candle. And that one that can't light the candle comes to the one who can light the candle, and they teach each other how to light the candle. Amen. Amen. And in lighting the candle, you beautify God's house. See, it, we, we have such wonderful things in the group what gift? I don't have any gift. Well, first of all, you're telling a story, and somebody needs to you know, give you some truth about that. But then second of all, then you need to find someone that does have the gift and let them become their friends. Amen. Well, I, I can do all this kind of stuff. Well, be careful or you'll have pride. Go over and help the one who can't do it, and then watch it grow together. See, that's what we have. All of us have special gifts in this church, and God wants us to use them. The devil wants us to not use them. And if, we, if, you, if it's good for you to hurry up and get away and, and not fellowship and not have all this kind of stuff, check your religion. Not, not, not check your relationship with God, not your religion. Check your relationship with God and see if it's what it should be. In Romans, he tells us, just as there are many parts to our bodies, so it is with Christ's body. We're all parts of it, and it takes every one of us to make it complete. For we each have different works to do, so we belong to each other, and each needs all the others. Amen. That's the body. And then lastly, he says, now you are the body of Christ, and each of you have a part in it. The uniting of the church is the heartbeat of Christianity. Amen. The uniting of the church is the heartbeat. I wonder if all your hearts are beating like they should this morning. What talent do you have? What talent do you have? Will you play that drum? God brought him in our church at the right time. How many of you have even met him? My name is Danny Callahan. What's your name? Oh, but what about Woody? What about people in here that's trying to be a part of our body but we won't welcome them? The uniting of the church is the heartbeat of Christianity. God put us all together. We all have different talents. I can't do what Will does back there. But will can keep us going. See, we, we've all got talents. And to sit there and say, you don't have anything, you're wrong. 
We've got to put them together and work for Christ. It's the heartbeat of Christianity. I want the heartbeat of this church to be strong. No blockage in our artery. Strong heart. And we do that by listening to the word, fellowshipping, eating, and praying. I want God to help me always be a part of the body. So I'm surrounded by a bunch of turkeys that watch me every day. Father, thank you for the body of Christ. I thank you, God, because I'm in it and a part of it, not just to receive from the body, but to give to the body. And I pray, God, that every person who's heard this sermon this morning will accept it as from God, and we will change our lives beginning now. I am committed. I am committed to hear the word and to believe the word and do the word. I am committed to having fellowship with all the people you've given me, not just a chosen few, all of them. I want to be a leader that steps out and prefers my brother. God, help me. I want to be a part of the eating and the fellowship, the cooking, the preparing, the cleaning. It's all a part of it. God, I want to be a part. And God, I vow I'm going to be a part of prayer. Prayer. Prayer, they said, is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. Can I do these four things? I will by faith. Faith in Jesus Christ to give me strength. God, I thank you for it. Let us all be strong. Let us rise up together this morning knowing I'm not just one. I am a part of a group. And what a holy group I have. Teach us to care, to love, to pray for one another, to give, to do all we could. God, I thank you for this this day. And I tell you I love you in Jesus' name. Amen.